Hello. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome one and all, and thank you for being here. Tonight, I think you're gonna hear some very great news in the area of education, and also some very great news for any of our soldiers suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, Operation Warrior Wellness. Now this microphone's gonna get turned over to Bobby Roth, Bobby is the Vice President of the David Lynch Foundation and pretty much works 24-7 to help people all over the world. Please welcome the great Bobby Roth. Thank you very much, David. And on behalf of the David Lynch Foundation, it's wonderful to welcome you all here tonight. <clears throat> it's been said that America, Americans, are swimming in an ocean of stress. And if that's the case, our children are drowning in it, our veterans are drowning in it, American Indians living on impoverished reservations are drowning in it. So many at-risk people in this country are drowning in stress. But it's not just stress anymore. It's traumatic stress, far deeper far more insidious, and that is a reminder for cell phones. <laughs> Not as stressful as that, but please turn off your cell phone. I cued the cell phone there so that, otherwise it would have been a little obtrusive if I would have said something. Um, but traumatic stress, and for those fortunate children and those fortunate individuals who have access to medication and have access to talk therapy, there is some help, but for millions and millions and millions of people who go untreated, unhealed, and even those who have medication and talk therapy, it's some help. 10 million children in America on antidepressant medication under the age of 12. Five million children diagnosed with ADHD, and the number three cause of death in, among teenagers in this country, suicide. We have a very serious problem. And tonight, in a very enjoyable way, we're gonna look at a very substantive solution. And we're going to investigate the power of meditation. You've all heard that. But specifically, we're going to investigate the power of a technique called transcendental meditation a technique that David Lynch has been practicing for almost 40 years, and as he likes to say, has never missed a meditation in those years. A technique that has enormous amount of research. And we're gonna look at it, as David said, in two main areas, schools and also our veterans. And to start, our first speaker is a great psychiatrist, world-renowned psychiatrist, and a researcher at the National Institutes of Mental Health for 20 years, and he was the first to describe what's called Seasonal Affective Disorder, SAD, um, and his new book, and you're all getting a copy of it, called Transcendence, Healing and Transformation Through Transcendental Meditation, just found out that in the June 19th edition of the New York Times is number seven on the New York Times bestseller list. Dr. Rosenthal practices here in Bethesda. So really, without further ado, I'd like to ask Norman, hope you don't mind, Norman, that you come and tell us about the meditation, about your journey, how you wrote this book. Please welcome Dr. Norman Rosenthal. Good evening, everybody. I must tell you, it's a little bit surprising for me to be here talking to you all about meditation. About five years ago, I would never have predicted or anticipated that I would be doing so. Because for many years, I have practiced psychiatry, I have researched, and haven't really given much thought to meditation at all. Now, I'm always very interested in what my patients tell me. I listen, I'm really fascinated it's one of my great joys is I love, I love my work. 
But every now and then, somebody says something that just fires my researcher's imagination. And I think to myself, you know, I really have to find out more about this. And that happened to me some years ago when I was back at the NIMH. And somebody told me about regular mood changes that occurred with the seasons, when the days got short and dark. And the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle came together. Um, and along with our team there, uh, some of whom are even here this evening, uh, we put together the puzzle of seasonal affective disorder and the novel treatment of light therapy, which at that time, I can tell you, people thought was pretty wacky, but which has since become a mainstream treatment. Now, a similar thing happened to me about five or six years ago when a young man with bipolar disorder, whom I was treating, uh, began to talk with me about transcendental meditation. Now, of course, we all know bipolar disorder is a serious condition, and it requires medications and various standard treatments. But what this young man said to me was, you know, along with everything you're giving me, there's something else that I have added to the mix that is making me really happy 90% of the time, and that is transcendental meditation. And I quizzed him about that, and I said, you know, I did that way back in South Africa when the Beatles went to visit Maharishi. <laughs> and then I just abandoned it. He said, you should get back to meditating, Dr. Rosenthal. So I listened, I listened. He said it again, he said it again. And I was thinking, yeah, yeah, where am I going to fit 20 minutes twice a day into my schedule? But you know, that was one of those moments where I thought, wow, you know, he says it's really helped him. He says it stabilized him. What have I got to lose? Let me give it a shot. So my good friend Bob Roth happened to be in town, and he refreshed my technique. You know, once you've got that mantra, then it's with you forever, and taught me how to use it properly. And you know, I, I wish I could say that there was a sudden epiphany, but there wasn't. Uh, but I kept at it, prompted by my patient who kept saying, now, are you doing it regularly? You've got to do it regularly. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not going to work. So I started to do it regularly. And then gradually, something very interesting became, began to happen in my head. I got calmer and less reactive. You know, the ordinary irritations and the frustrations, the disappointments of everyday life uh, that would rattle me. Now, I still don't like them, believe me. But instead of the reflexive reaction, I just began to have a more thoughtful response. A simple example is somebody cuts you off in the traffic. And I've seen people cussing, and I used to be one of those people. but. But really, I'm much more likely to say, you know, maybe he's in a hurry, maybe he has an emergency, maybe he has a problem, but why should I let it become my problem? And it's coming from a very authentic place. It's not a cognitive therapy thing that I've, as soon as I feel angry, I then I say, well, no, no, wait a sec, now you're feeling angry and you've got a bad thought and then you've got to fix that and you've got to have a good thought instead. It's just, coming kind of very organically from within. And that was really interesting. And you know, I've, I've been a fairly organized person, but I became more so, better at setting priorities, better at getting things done. So you know, I've always kind of used myself as a bit of a, a laboratory for my, for my patients. And I thought, you know, it's really helping me. Maybe I should recommend it to this person with an anxiety problem, or that person with an alcohol problem, or whatever, whatever. And I'm finding that it's beginning to help people. They're coming back to me. They're saying it's really helping. Some, of course, more than others. One very dramatic case, a woman um, whose husband had a really terrible anger problem. And they had tried absolutely everything with very little benefit. Woman is a, a therapist herself. And um, it just didn't help. And it was very unhappy. He was really a nice guy. And nothing had helped. And I thought, what's to lose here? So I 
explain the story. And recently I had occasion to ask her, and she said, you know, it's an absolute game changer. She said, after everything we went through, I just can't believe that this technique has made that much difference. Now, of course, you know, we all know nothing is a panacea. But even if some people are getting this degree of benefit, then surely it's something we need to be exploring. And indeed, the next thing was that I did do some research on it uh, in post-traumatic stress disorder uh, in veterans who had been in combat. You're going to hear more about that later. But last week, we had a, a paper published in Military Medicine uh, on five veterans uh, who had done TM for their combat-related PTSD, um, you know, with, with really good effects. At a basic level, it's kind of intriguing that they were able to actually sit there and do the technique, that it was feasible. But much more than that, within two months, they had a 50% decrease in their PTSD symptoms. And one of these gentlemen you're actually going to hear from tonight, but I reached three of them recently, and they're still meditating, they're still benefiting, they're still enjoying it. And you know, it's a, it's a small number, but I think it's remarkable. And we also did a study in bipolar uh, disorder, and by the end of these two studies, almost every clinician in my group was getting trained in TM at their own expense. <laughs> How's my timing? Have I got a little time? Yeah, yeah. He's my timekeeper. Um, anyway, so, uh, you know, it, it's really good for us to wonder, what is it about this technique? This really simple, effortless technique, you do it tw twice a day for 20 minutes, such a gentle technique that can have such a profound effect. And the answer comes in a single word, and that word is stress, because stress is everywhere. I see it in my patients and myself. I see it on the evening news, hurricanes, tornadoes, poverty, unemployment, illnesses, wars. We see it every day. We'll see it in the combat-related PTSD that you're going to be hearing down the line. And, and it's, it's a really terrible thing, the stress that goes on and on, because really the stress response is geared to be a short, targeted response to a specific issue. It's not supposed to go on and on, and it can be really devastating if it does. The great scientist who described first the harmful effects of stress, Selye, said, it's not stress that kills us. It's our reaction and response to it. And indeed, it does kill. Um, and as we know, uh, cardiovascular disease is, is one of the biggest killers. It kills one in three people. And I would actually like to show you just a few slides which illustrates the direct connection between TM, stress, illness, and death. Over here, we have several stress management techniques and their effects on blood pressure. Here we have TM, which has the largest effect. This is called a meta-analysis where you pool the results of many different studies. And look here, muscle relaxation, biofeedback, significantly less reduction in blood pressure. And this combination treatment actually makes blood pressure worse. <laughs> so when somebody says they're going to get a stress management technique, you've got to ask them, which one are you going to get? Because <laughs> it does really make a difference. There's a specificity here. And of course, we know that uh, high blood pressure is, as we call it, the silent killer. Next slide, please. And how does it kill? Here we've got a cartoon of two arteries. This one is nice and open with the clean linings of the artery, and this one you see is being infiltrated with cholesterol and inflammatory processes, and you see it's getting blocked off. So whatever the organ is at the other side of this artery, it's in good shape over there, but it's in trouble over there. So if this is your heart at the other end of that artery, you're a candidate for a heart attack. Or if it's your brain, you're a candidate for a stroke. Next slide, please. And this, in fact, does play out, because what these ingenious researchers did, this is the brilliant work of Robert Schneider and his collaborators, is 
they followed up people who years before had been in this random controlled study of TM for blood pressure. And what they found when they looked at the death records in the counties where these people had been studied was a 25% reduction in mortality over the seven or eight year follow-up period in the group that had done the TM seven or eight years before. And remember, they don't even know if these people continued to meditate or not. But so profound was the effect that over the course of years, it played out in the form of prolonged longevity. To their credit, they then went and did a prospective replication where they randomized to TM versus a health education control and what you see, this is the, the rates of death, heart attack, and stroke in a health education group versus a TM group. And over five years, there was almost a 50% risk reduction in these hard end points, meaning fewer events and later events occurred. So what you're seeing here is a technique so gentle, so subtle, so effortless, but so powerful that day after day, year after year, it plays out in terms of major cardiovascular illness and longevity. And if it's doing that at the physical level, it's not difficult to imagine that it's doing that at the psychological level as well. Decreasing anxiety, decreasing stress, increasing joy. So. I'll leave you all with that thought. Thank you.